presentation is with Dr. Ajay Kumar, and he will be discussing the results of a, a long-term study, a large-scale study, uh, that is GRADE study. Mm -hmm. Actually, the meaning of the GRADE is Glycemia Reduction Approaches in Diabetes, a Comparative Effectiveness. Basically, this is a long-term study done in not in India, but in US, and uh, they compared four drugs, and they came with some very interesting data. And I think uh, we have wonderful speaker for this uh, study uh, review. And Dr. Ajay Kumar is uh, a director, Diabetes Care Research Center in Patna. He had been principal investigator in INDAP study for Bihar. He has participated in large number of drug trials. In fact, uh, number goes as big as uh, that I can speak for 20 minutes on those studies. And he is author of several book chapters, a large number of publications to his uh, credit. So over to Dr. Ajay Kumar. It's my pleasure and privilege to be part of this scientific feast that we have been witnessing over the last couple of days. And my brief this afternoon is to decipher the information presented at ADA about the greatest study about which the chairperson has very nicely introduced. Now it's very important for all of us to appreciate that when we treat patients of type 2 diabetes, we generally start with lifestyle modification and metformin. But then that's not enough for majority of the patients and we need to understand that we will add one or the other medication or a combination of medications. Now, great study exactly tried to answer this question, but in the process, what we see that at one particular point of time, when a study is designed, it takes into consideration the prevailing availability of the drugs and the trend at that point of time. And considering that into our, you know, discussion, we had these four classes of drugs which were added to patients of type 2 diabetes who had an HbA1c between 6.8% to 8.5%. And this is very logical because if you have an A1c which is close to 1 or 1.5% more, then only there is a room for adding a single drug, otherwise you would have needed to add combination drugs over metformin. So I think GRADE was in the right direction and the four drugs that were chosen at that point of time was glimepiride, which is a sulfonylurea, Citagliptin, which is a DPP-4 inhibitor, liraglutide, which is a GLP-1 receptor agonist, and insulin glargine, which is a basal insulin. One can ask that why SGLT-2 inhibitor was not added. So let me explain that right in the beginning. That was clarified by one of the speakers during the great presentation, that at that point of time, the FDA-approved drugs did not include SGLT-2 inhibitor. Canagliflozin was just knocking the door, but when the trial started, a little after the start of the trial, canagliflozin was approved by the FDA. And it was not possible for many logistic regions to include SGLT2 subsequently in the course of the trial because it was a very well designed trial which was supposed to go on for almost four to eight years' time. In fact, on completion, we have the five years' data. So that clearly explains as to why these four drugs were chosen. Now, what was the primary endpoint of this particular study? And this is very important to understand because when you look at the results, you might confuse. This is one trial where the primary output is actually a failure. So those patients of type 2 diabetes who are not on target, as I said, 6.78% to 8.5%, they were added a drug. And if they continued to have an A1C of more than 7%, we know that in majority of the patients, we have an A1C target of less than 7%. So after three months or so, if that particular patient is beyond 7%, then this is called the primary endpoint. That means this particular drug has failed in this particular patient. And there was a secondary endpoint that subsequent to that, in the further follow-up, if in spite of the combination or whatever rescue medication, medication was used, and in this case, it was the protocol which said that if somebody has failed on glimepiride plus metformin, then the next, next drug has to be insulin glargine. So in all the failure arms, it was insulin glargine which was added. And then if on that combination, that is the secondary endpoint, 7.5%, you will still fail, then you have a tertiary endpoint where patients on metformin, the other drug and insulin glargine, and yet the 7.5% target is not achieved, then you need to further intensify the treatment. So we have the primary endpoint, secondary endpoint, and the tertiary endpoint. 
the the important thing that has to be considered by the audience this afternoon is that this was an american study this was only recruiting people from america no other part of the world and no indian patient no asian patients were recruited except for a very small 4% of the asian population which are residing in united states of america so that caveat is there and before we proceed to translate the results of this particular study into our clinical practice the second important thing is that the baseline characteristics of all the four groups almost a little more than 5000 patients were recruited that gives you almost 1200 odd patients in each of the arms and as i said metformin plus glimepiride or metformin plus sitagliptin metformin plus liraglutide or metformin plus insulin glargine so what happens now let me first tell you about few of the very interesting facts about the trial in spite of being a very long term trial the adherence rate was more than 90% in fact the data is available for 98.5% of the patients and the last one year of the trial was affected by corona the epidemic the pandemic of corona and even in that the percentage of patients who completed the trial was a little less than 90% that is 89 or 88 point something percent so we have a fairly good outcome of the study and whatever data is there is a robust data and we can dwell upon the analysis of that particular data so having given you the background of this study now let us look at the outcome which was presented by you know eminent endocrinologists of the world like david nathan john buse stephen kahn they are all the who's who's of the diabetes and endocrinology in the world i am not going to take individual names for each of the data but it's important to appreciate that what exactly happened now when you fail on a patient of metformin then when you add any of these four drugs the fastest that you fail that happened in grade study was with sitagliptin which tells you that amongst the four drug sitagliptin is least effective in terms of maintaining an hba1c with a target of less than 7% the second in line was glimepiride so glimepiride was a little better than sitagliptin in terms of maintaining the hba1c in less than 7% and that was followed by insulin glargine and that was followed by glp1 receptor agonist liraglutide so at the end of the study when you look at the entire data there were significant differences between insulin glargine glp1 receptor agonist on one side and sitagliptin and glimepiride on the other side a statistically significant difference but there was no statistically significant difference between glp1 receptor agonist liraglutide and insulin glargine so the first message that clearly comes out of this great study is that liraglutide and insulin glargine are far superior in terms of achieving a good glycemic control for a prolonged period of time and this is a very important message the second important thing is that when you start failing you keep on adding drugs and that is called rescue medication so you have to look at the secondary end point and then the tertiary end point so after one year of the study and in the first year as i said sitagliptin was fastest to fail but subsequently most of the lines remained parallel at the end of four years or five years now we have given you the data that glp1 receptor agonist liraglutide came on the top slightly followed by insulin glargine though no statistically significant difference now this is very important to understand that these were the patients of type 2 diabetes who were only taking metformin and this is extremely important these are not treatment naive patients neither these are patients who are fairly advanced in their you know natural history of type 2 diabetes because they are on monotherapy the inclusion criteria clearly mention that these patients have to be of less than 10 years of diabetes duration and they must be taking only metformin at least 500 mg and in the you know initial phase of the study for 2 weeks they were tit up titrated to have the recommended dose 2 grams of metformin 1 to 8 mg of glimepiride insulin glargine titrated to get a fasting plasma glucose of 80 to 130 and liraglutide from 0.6 mg to 1.8 mg so these are the standard doses but just to recapitulate this was the standard tre treatment given to all the four arms of the patient now having looked at the outcome in terms of glycemic control and the duration of control the other conclusion that we draw from this great study discussion that happened at the ada 
was that 71 to 73 percent of the patients eventually failed which means that after three years time only 29 percent of the patients on a combination therapy keep themselves in the target of HbA1c of less than 7 percent all others will require additional medications which clearly tells you that type 2 diabetes is a very difficult ball game you need to understand that this is a condition characterized by inexorable decline in beta cell function and you have to keep on escalating therapy you have to keep an eye on your patient the next issue is the microvascular outcome and the macrovascular outcomes because the only purpose of looking at the outcome in a type 2 diabetic treatment plan is that it's not only the glycemic control that we are looking at but whether it makes a salutary impact in reducing the microvascular complication as well as the macrovascular complication so let me first decipher the discussion that happened around the microvascular complications what were the endpoints which i looked at the albumin creatinine ratio the egfr and in terms of neuropathy the important thing was the peripheral sensory neuropathy now unfortunately at the end of the study none of these four arms showed any significant statistically significant difference amongst each other that means the microvascular complications will continue to rise which was seen in this particular study and there was no difference in the four arms in terms of you know a particular benefit in terms of reducing either the renal complication or the neurological complications so what is the message that we get that whatever benefit in terms of reducing microvascular complication happens it happens because of good glycemic control it is not a property of an individual drugs having said that we also know that after the grade study we had number of dedicated cardiovascular outcome studies in which the renal endpoints were very robustly looked at and we know that certain classes of drugs like glp1 receptor agonist and sglt2 inhibitors actually have a very big impact in reducing the cardiorenal outcomes therefore if the grade study had more patients or was followed for a longer period of time whether this difference will become manifest it is a matter of conjecture but at this point of time so far as the grade results are concerned that did not show any difference in the microvascular outcome in the four different groups then coming to the macrovascular outcomes there was a very clear trend when we look, look at the outcome in terms of cardiovascular diseases the three point maze the heart failure the total mortality the cardiovascular mortality it was a very clear trend that liraglutide outperformed insulin glargin glimepiride and sitagliptin liraglutide had the minimum incidence of cardiovascular diseases in the five years follow up although when they looked at the mace and the heart failure and the total mortality there was no significant difference another very important thing is that these are preliminary results 10% of the patients have still not been adjudicated from this particular study for the cardiovascular outcome therefore in future we expect a lot of other analysis to come out from the grade study and that will throw much more light as to what exactly will happen and whether the graph of the benefit of liraglutide will continue to diverge if the study was you know continued for a longer period of time because we don't treat type 2 diabetes patient only for five years we treat type 2 diabetes patients for three four decades for a particular patient and this is extremely important that if you can demonstrate a significant difference within a span of four to five years time that can certainly be magnified when you actually follow these patients on a longer term basis now having looked at these outcomes of the grade study now the important thing is how to translate what lessons do we learn from this particular study in terms of translating this into our clinical practice as i said all four drugs are good when i say that there were differences in the achieving the glycemic control maintaining the glycemic control there were differences but at the same time it has to be appreciated that all four, all four drugs were effective sitagliptin was least effective followed by glimepiride followed by glargin followed by liraglutide and liraglutide offered the additional advantage of reducing the cardiovascular disease no significant difference in the microvascular complication there are many other important things which actually go into the protocol of this particular study that they are looking at various parameters in terms of even pharmacogenomic responses of these individual classes of drug but those analysis will come in future and at this point of time we can only stipulate 
or we can make conjectures about the possible mechanism as to why insulin glargine and liraglutide were better as compared with glimepiride and DPP-4 inhibitors. And we can take those issues during the question answer session. But this is the major, you know, results, design and the outcomes and the possible explanations of the results of the grade study. I think we I, we, I stop here and then take up questions during the question answer session. Thank you very much.